Denny Dent Brandt has uh, graciously agreed to come back and talk a little bit about this, her journey with this. She was on several months ago with her new book. Uh, it's called Unleash Your God-Given Healing. And uh, Jenny, welcome back to the show. Well, it's great to be here, and I'm happy to talk about this because I would love to help some women, even some men, avoid this journey. Before I get into this, did your book, Unleashing Your God-Given Healing, is, did this come out of your journey from, from breast cancer? Is that what, what sparked this yes, particular it did. journey? Okay, good. It good. did, That's because it sent me on a quest to figure out what caused it and what I was going to do to help my doctors to beat the cancer. And so it certainly did. I learned so much. I said, goodness, people need to know this because some of the same mistakes I made are the same mistakes a lot of people are making. Well, knowledge is power. And we are all about equipping, educating the family caregiver. And uh, this is a disease. I don't have the stats in front of me, Jenny, but this is a disease that affects an enormous amount of women and men. One um, in eight women. One in eight. That's, that's too many. Mm. Well, I've I've had several friends that have gone through this. Uh, it, it's a tough thing. We had a, a a lady on the show several months ago who's got a special needs son, and she was dealing with all of his stuff that had some kind of tumor situation going on. They were dealing; they were in the throes of that, mm-hmm. and then she got the news for herself that she had to deal with breast cancer. And right, so right. it's it's there. And so this month we take time out as a nation, really worldwide, to uh, recognize the journey that so many have to take and the steps that are being taken. So take us back to, do you ha- start off with this? And you, I don't want you to share anything you're not comfortable sharing, but was this a historic um, event in your family? Did you have a history with this or does this kind of come out of the blue with you? Well, it was not a history in my family, but my mother got it at 82 years old and she died. Uh, it was four months after she died that I found the lump in my breast. So it was really raw, and I was still grieving her loss when I found it. So it really, that began the history in our family. But the doctors at Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Chicago tested me because there are eight risk factors for breast cancer. And when I didn't have one of them, they said, well, it must be genetics. So they did extensive genetic testing. Nothing showed up. So I had no risk factors, and no genetics. And that's what sent me on the quest to find out then what caused this. Something caused it. It didn't just happen, you know. So that's why I went on the quest and did all the research and, you know, just studied and read medical journals and went to cancer conventions and, you know, read books by doctors who were experts in cancer. And I started connecting the dots and saying, okay, I'm seeing some things here. Yes, there is a reason. I got a breast cancer I had no risk factors or genetics for. If you don't mind, and I, I, I feel a little bit queasy asking this, but how old were you when you were diagnosed with this? I always feel queasy asking a woman how old she was at anything. Yeah. But, oh, that's okay, but, <laughs> because I'm tur- I, this is today is my birthday, and I just turned a little bit older. Well, I was I going was 50, to – you <laughs> beat me to that. Diagnosed. I knew it was your birthday. I knew it was your birthday, so happy birthday yeah. to you. John, you going to sing to her? I uh, well, I think I can spare us all that and just wish you a very happy birthday. <laughs> but, but, well, thank so, you. It's been a good. So it's been a good birthday. But age is a risk factor. Sixty and up is where the risk really increases. It's not that you can't get it before, but it starts to rapidly increase when you get sixty and up because your immune system is aging. Of course, we discussed before all these things you can do so your immune system doesn't age as much like diet and exercise and hydration and sleep. So, you know, there are certainly things you can you can do. But I was 58. So I was close to a risk factor on that one. But the doctor said, technically, you don't have that that risk factor. Obesity is the number one risk factor for all cancers. And I did not have that risk factor. But in my research, I learned that the more fat cells you have, estrogen stores in those fat cells. And so we don't want to get overweight because of the risk factor for any cancer. And that has caused me, even though the doctor said I wasn't overweight, to lose an additional 15 to 20 pounds because I was up 30 pounds from when I got married. Well, why did I need that extra weight? It's not doing me any good. One of the, the issues that virtually every caregiver deals with is, is excessive weight gain. It's one of the landmines I put in my book, Seven Caregiver Landmines. And I, 
I soared up pretty high. I mean, I, I tell John I got so big that I left shoe prints in dry concrete. I mean, it was, you know, and, uh, and, and so the I, and says, yeah. Hey, break it up. <laughs> uh, I, I broke my family tree. It took two dogs to bark at me. And my picture fell off the wall, but I, no, I, uh, I, I know that there are a lot, I think for me, Jenny, that I, I saw a lady pushing her elderly mother in a wheelchair at the, at the hospital the other day. And the woman that was pushing her mother, taking care of her mother, because uh, I heard the, when they were checking in, just she introduced herself to the ladies as her, as her daughter, but she was morbidly obese. And the mother was real skinny and frail, but this girl was morbidly obese. And I was just like, oh, my heart went out. And I, so I know that there, this is a problem for so many family caregivers. And so many family caregivers are women. And if they're overweight, Guess what? And, this is that, it, this that's is a, that's a risk factor. Yeah, this yeah. is a risk factor, yeah. and so this is why it's so important for you to come on and talk about this because there are women right now that are listening that are thinking, okay, all right, what do I need to do? And so, what did you do? You said you were thirty pounds overweight, which is yes, not I did. which is not bad. We were all skinny when we got married. Yeah, <laughs> but if for my, you know what? What's bad for one body? Some people need fifty to hundred pounds overweight for their blood sugar and their blood pressure isn't impacted. In my case. I think it only takes 20 or 30 pounds. So it was not needed in my case either. And I did, for the moment they said, you have cancer, that kind of curtailed my appetite, if you know what I mean. When you start eating foods that aren't high in the carbs and you start eating healthy things, then automatically I started losing weight. But I also do some intermittent fasting where I don't eat until 10 or 12 in the day, and then I finish at 6 o'clock at night, and I don't eat again until the next morning. I drink water, but I'm not taking in any calories because it allows your body to lose weight, and it allows your body to go into autophagy, which is where your body starts killing off those cells that could become cancer cells. What sort of things did you add uh, to your diet? I mean, uh, antioxidants, you know, berries, that kind of thing, or... Berries are anti-cancer, but the American Cancer Society even said this back in the 1990s. One of the best things you can do to avoid breast cancer is to eat cruciferous vegetables because they contain sulforaphane, and that lowers your estrogen load, and a lot of breast cancers are estrogen-fed in men as well. Men that get breast cancers are 90% estrogen-fed, and that should not be. But if you eat these cruciferous vegetables and things like flaxseed, you're going to lower that estrogen load, and that's going to help you to reduce your risk for breast cancer. So I have a smoothie recipe in my book that's banana chocolate blueberry smoothie that helps your brain, it helps your heart, it reduces your risk for cancer, and it contains two servings of cruciferous vegetables as well as the ground flax seeds. So both of those are risk How does factors. It, taste? No, it actually Dude, I've a lot of men, banana, a lot of blueberry. doctors have been in my home and I've made yeah. it for them and they said, you know, I can drink this. I can drink this. The chocolate and banana covers a multitude of things you would not normally <laughs> eat. That's all I can say. And I can't find anything to cover as well as the chocolate and this is raw cacao, the really healthy chocolate, that covers the other things in there that you might not want to eat. So I have a lot of cancer patients that can drink it, a lot of people doing it just to be healthy, and they say, I like this. I drink it. My husband and I drink it every day, and I can't drink something I don't like. Let's put it that way. Well, now, what, what kind of cruciferous vegetables, vegetables do you put in there? Well, I put in things like kale. I will put in arugula. I can put in um, cabbage. But I alternate between kale and arugula, and all different kinds of greens. Well, I've started but, to eat kale, by the way, and I've, I'm making a pretty good stab at it. It's, uh, it's different, but I'm, I'm making a good stab at it. <laughs> I'm making, yeah, you can. You know? Some of the kale salads are really good. You put yeah, nuts and, and, and different things in the right dressing. You know, you have to make it so it's palatable for you. But it's just, let's get back to the weight for a minute. You know, I said estrogen stores in fat cells. But when your body is overweight, the stress on your cortisol levels also increases estrogen. If your blood sugar is not below that, you know, A1C, that 5.7, then your estrogen levels go up when your blood sugar goes up. Now, 
people having, you know, high blood sugar is a prevalent problem in this country. If you get your weight down, your blood sugar and your blood pressure, they go down and your estrogen load may follow. It's the estrogen load over a lifetime that is driving these cancers. So we have to look at everything that adds to that estrogen load. So your book basically is a journey through all of this of rediscovering how you can take a little bit more control of your health. When you went through this, when you got this diagnosis, and this is what I'd like for you to spend a few moments with, and I'll tell you kind of where I'm going with this as we travel down the road. Um, Take us to that moment when you got the diagnosis. It was devastating. I just lost my mother and been through the journey with her, my sister and I both, and there was no way I wanted to go through what I saw her go through And here they prepare me that I'm going to go through it. And I'm like, this just can't be. So, but then to hear that you don't have the risk factors or the genetics, I mean, anybody would say, well, well, then what, what caused this? If I don't find out what caused it and identify some factors, how can I stop it from coming back? The doctors may may kill it. My my what? Your sister. How did did this affect her? I mean, did she, did she have the same problem? Honestly, I wouldn't tell her until the genetic test came back. Because, yes, I was very concerned about my sister hearing the news after she had lost my mother. And then she finds out her only sister has it. I mean, that's scary. So I waited until the test results came back and said it wasn't genetic. Because, you know, then I could yeah, say, you know, a, you don't have to worry. It's, it's not, you know, it's yeah, not an automatic thing. Well, yeah, there's no need to, to uh, you know, create more stress than we need to until you have some more data. Um, when you're, when you we can do an your, entire show on that, by the way. Yeah. yeah. When you, uh, when, when you, <laughs> when the doctor told you this, were you with your husband at the time or were you by yourself or how did that work? I was by myself. I was by myself. Each time they gave me bad news, I just happened to be by myself. The next week they told me it was aggressive. And then the next week is when they told me from the MRI, it appeared it was all over my body. And so each time I got bad news, I happened to be by myself. We, it's not the way we we planned it, but my husband has a full time job. So, yeah, that was well. Hmm, and that there, was a there's bummer. a reason I'm asking. The reason I'm asking this is because there are a lot of people that do have very very scary diagnosis, and they're alone. And I want I would like for you to tell what did you what was that car ride home like? What was that like? Well, my husband picked me up okay. and thought I wasn't going to get bad news, and we drove straight to the Atlanta airport because we were going for a second opinion. Once they said it was aggressive, that was our cue. Get a second opinion. So we hopped on that airplane. We were both in shock. And then when we got up to CTCA, it took them five days to do a second opinion and to tell us, you know, it may not, it is aggressive. Your life is in danger. Every weapon of mass destruction is going to be brought out to save your life. However, it may not be all over your body. That, what we saw was, we think, is inflammation that was from a bad biopsy. So I just had to get the, you know, not so good luck that the biopsy went bad and and threw a debris of inflammation all over my body, which was not good, but at least it wasn't cancer all over my body. Right. That must right, have been a yeah. very like long not, pain not... plane ride, though. Yes, it was. <laughs> Yeah, it like John, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm just like, hey, it's it's you know, this is bad. They the bad biopsy, but uh, by the way, not cancer. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Yes, and when they finally confirmed that, and they wouldn't know for the for sure until the surgery. When they finally con, you know, said it is not all over your body, mm-hmm. then I knew I would have more of a chance of living. A stage four cancer, aggressive, they can only extend your life. Okay if they can beat it. And so you might live an extra year or two, but then you're going to die from all the, you know, they're going to have to keep treating you and you're going to die from either the chemicals or from the cancer, whichever comes first. So, you know, to know that it wasn't all over your body meant I had a chance, a better chance of living. So that was a big, huge relief. I did not want the chemotherapy, but as I said in the book, I figured out how to get through it, how to use exercise and water and diet and sleep and all these things and nourishing my gut to make the prognosis better. And I went through it with flying colors, which is rare for what I got. But what I want your listeners to hear is some things that just help everybody avoid 
breast cancer, things that people don't know. Like, you know, you heard the president this week was on vitamin D uh, because of the coronavirus, and even Dr. Fauci was using vitamin D, but it's recommended to avoid cancer. And in breast cancer, there is critical research that shows it lowers your risk for breast cancer if you will keep your vitamin D levels high through this vitamin D 25 hydroxy blood test that your doctor can do on you. Even my three Mm. doctors told me if you had had your levels between 70 and 90, you might not have gotten cancer in the first place. I'm like, whoa, wish I'd known that. So it's important for your listeners to know. Sadly, that information was a little tardy, wasn't it? Yeah, (laughs) I wish. But if you've got, if you're a caretaker, and you're taking care of someone day in and day out. Hey, get those vitamin D levels up. You've already got stress. You've already kind of confined and, you know, you're already having enough struggles. Get those vitamin D levels up. And another thing that's important that was a shock to me, when I got to CTCA in Chicago, they said, oh, we had them send up your mammograms from your previous years. It was missed on two mammograms. This cancer was there two years ago, and it got missed. Why? Because I had dense breasts. Forty to 50% of women have dense breasts. I did not know it. Now the radiologists have to tell you, but if yours is not telling you when you go for your mammogram, I want every woman to ask this question. Do I have dense breasts? And if they tell you you do, then you have to realize you need to really do the self-checks Keep those doctor's appointments every year. You're not going to be able to depend on the mammogram itself to diagnose like someone who doesn't have dense breasts. And they do have a 3D mammogram now, so that's a little more accurate. But my doctors don't even trust that for me. Mm. So you have to look at the the self-checks are important. They're going to pull out an MRI for me from now on. Almost every year I'm going to have to do that because I have dense breasts and I had an aggressive breast cancer. But what I'm saying is these self-checks are important because I found mine by accident. But if you're self-checking every month and you have an aggressive cancer, by the time you get back around to that doctor's appointment, it could have grown out and gotten to your lymph nodes by then because it's aggressive. So I really recommend these self-checks. A lot of women find their breast cancer because of the self-checks. 72% of caregivers don't see their own doctor regularly. And the vast majority of caregivers, over 60%, 65% of them, are women. Now, that, there are more and more men that are doing this. But if you've got that many women out there who are taking care of someone else and the stress, you know, you've done it, you did it with your dad. The stress yeah. is, is, is um, unrelenting and, and without mercy. Then you couple yeah. that with the fact that they're not seeing their doctor regularly. This is why I had you on the show, because I want people to understand how you can take charge of this. Even while you're dealing with all the caregiving stuff, you, you, you've got to do these things. You've uh, in the still last, got to take care of your own needs. That's right. You do. In the last few minutes, um, I want you to say something. I, I didn't. I don't. I don't rehearse questions and things with folks because I just felt like it's. It's just. It comes across to you know, cable news, and this is where we're just having a conversation. <laughs> we're just sitting. Just this is a couple of caregivers sitting around talking about our own health. What would you like to say to husbands who are? picking their wife up at their doctor after hearing a news like that and taking them to the airport like your husband did. I mean, what would you want to say to those men out there who are trying to care for their wives in getting this kind of diagnosis? What are some things you'd like to share with them? Love them unconditionally. I have to tell you this. I mean, after I lost every hair on my head and I was a little bit less weight and my eyebrows were gone, okay, my husband looks at me every morning I would wake up and he would say, honey, you're still the most beautiful woman east of the Mississippi River. Now, I'm getting worried about what those women look like, right? Because right. <laughs> I didn't look too hot. But the point is, he loved me anyway. Unconditional love helps you to heal. If you sense that that person doesn't love you because you don't look as good, I mean, that's, that's tough. That unconditional love. And I think of the, of the women who don't have a husband to pick them up. Maybe they're alone in this world. 
then you would need your church family and other friends to come around you, sit with you during chemo. I had a different person sit with me. My husband couldn't fly to Chicago for every chemo. I had a former principal sit with me. I had some friends from college, at Wheat, from Wheaton College, come and sit with me during my chemotherapy. It was an all-day marathon, you know. So I think it's important that the husband do it, if at all possible, but if they're, if they're working, someone needs to be with you when you go through that chemotherapy so that your mind is occupied on positive things and not just sitting there and sulking the whole time. That positive attitude, that love, knowing someone loves you and cares makes a difference. Did your mood change? Did you go through a lot of mood swings through this? You know, I went through a lot of fear of waking up and saying, oh, honey, do I really have cancer or is this just a nightmare that I can't wake up from? But he would he would lift me up, and I'm not the kind of person to stay down very long, and I used exercise to keep my moods up because that serotonin goes off when you exercise. I kept busy. I kept busy praying, studying his word, concentrating on the good things, and singing, laughing. All these things lift your mood. I mean, it makes chemicals go off in your body that help you from becoming depressed. But you have to learn that you cannot ride the roller coaster ride of emotions and just let it get out of control the whole time because your body is set to heal when you calm the emotional brain by using prayer, by using his word, meditating on his word, gratitude and looking for all the good things that happen along the way. Those are beautiful well words, put. Jenny. Yeah. Well, well put. And this is Jenny's message that it's there. The path is there. She's laid it out for you. Would you take advantage of it? Get her book today and start becoming healthier as you serve as a caregiver. Healthy caregivers make better caregivers. JennyBrant.com. G-I-N-N-Y-B-R-A-N-T.com. Jenny, thank you so much for being a part of the show. 